Welcome, everyone, to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner. They call me Wolf. You're not allowed to call me that unless you're my friend. But if you're listening to the show, you're probably a friend, and, or unless you're that, in that 0.001% that just listens to the show to critique me and, and then be a troll, and in which case, I don't care what you call me. And so uh, with me today is Barton. Barton, you want to say hi? Yeah, hello, everyone. Barton Nunley. How's all the paratroopers doing? No, and and he's out. He's out there good. in the LBL swinging his swords. We hope he doesn't fall and hurt himself with his swords. Um, we're, oh yeah, really? <laughs> that would be a shame. That would be terrible. So we have a, we have a great show planned for tonight. So what we got? We got a guest coming on. Uh, but real quick, let me give you the email address: Josh Turner at prtpodcast dot com. Josh Turner at prtpodcast dot com. Uh, send me your stories. Or you can send me a friend request on Facebook. You can talk to me through Messenger like a lot of fans do. But make sure that you let me know that you are a listener of the show and a fan. If not, then I'm probably not going to approve your friend request. People are always like, oh, you're not approving my friend request. Well, you got to let me know who you are, man. Otherwise, I don't know you. Um, we have to, you know, there has to be a connection there. So anyways, Instagram, Josh Turner 940 You can follow me on Instagram, uh, Josh Turner 940 I don't, there's not a whole lot of interesting stuff just some pictures and stuff but uh I, I don't do a lot of twitter so other than that uh the groups on facebook paranormal roundtable paranormal lounge we have a bunch of different groups um can't even get into them all paranormal prayer group which is nelly's uh we have um paranormal trucker podcast with john king uh just there's a bunch of them we, I, th- I think we just got into daryl denton's group too right barton i think we're in his group um Right. Yeah, and then Todd Tate has a group. Two or three groups there. Yeah, and so then Barton, you have a group too. You want to say what it is? Sure, it's in Humanoids with Barton Nunley. Yeah, just Everybody hit 3,000. Everybody come on in and set a spell. Yep, and so we have a guest on tonight that I've been, I've been, we've been playing tag for a long time, me and this guy. We've been trying to get him on, and he's a, he's a, he's a good friend of mine and Barton's good friend, Linda Godfrey. And so Chad at Lewis, you want to say hello, Chad? Greetings from the Northwoods of Wisconsin. <laughs> and so, Chad, I am a fan of your work, and I've read some of your your books. I, I fantastic job. You do a fantastic job, and right. you come touted like my my fa- personal friends, like like uh, you know Lyle Blackburn, Ken Gerhard, Nick Redfern. They all talk very highly of you, Barton. Everybody speaks highly of you, and you're well respected in the community. So, I've been. It's an honor to be able to get you on the show and talk with you. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, you know, me and Barton have been doing a series of interviews on Bigfoot uh, slash Dogman, you know, cryptids slash Inhumanoids. And so we're going to kind of talk about that because, Chad, you have so much to talk about. Chad's written a book called The Van Meter v- Visitor. Really good book. If you haven't had a chance, and Chad is going to come on the live stream and, and talk to and uh, give us a little more time. But today we're going to focus on those particular uh the Dogman, Wendigo, and Bigfoot, those particular cryptid slash and humanoids. So um, let's get your thoughts, uh, Chad. What you've, you've researched Bigfoot. Let's start with that. That's a big subject. You don't have to give us all the meat and potatoes, but give us what your thoughts are. Sure. Of course, you know, when most people think of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, they think of the heavily forested northwestern portion of the U.S. They don't often think of the Midwest, but where I'm out of, the Midwest, we get dozens of reports every year of people who have seen something. They simply, you know, for lack of a better term, they're calling it a Bigfoot. You know, six to eight feet tall, a biped running upright on its hind legs like you and I, covered in fur, you know, heavily built. Uh, They're convinced it's nothing that they've ever seen before. You know, and again, they might be a little shy and embarrassed about reporting it because they know how it sounds, but yet they're convinced that they've seen what we would consider a traditional Bigfoot. And traditional Bigfoot being like what? Like, what would you, what would you consider to be a traditional Bigfoot? Yes. So traditional Bigfoot would be, you just catch a glimpse of something big, the stereotypical, what you would turn on the television and see someone having a drawing of Bigfoot. But there are other cases I've received where uh, people believe that it was something more supernatural in its ability. For instance, a uh, a person called me from the north woods of Wisconsin up on the reservation, 
And her and her family believed they were cursed after seeing a Sasquatch. And what had happened is they had spotted one several times on the outside of their home. And one of the sons went out to the car one night to get something, and he spotted this thing at the cornfield on his property. And this witness, the young man, was a big guy, 6'3", well over 200 pounds, and he said whatever was standing there dwarfed him. Gigantic. And he was terrified, went back in to get a flashlight, came out, the thing was gone. And it was his belief and his family's belief that this was a bad omen, a harbinger of ill fate to come to them. And sure enough, he was hit with a series of mishaps, misfortune, and death because uh, he lost his job. He was involved in a car accident. He was at a party one night and there was a gun on his chair and he went to move it uh, to sit down and it went off and struck and killed a uh, young girl by accident. And this was well over 10 years ago when I first went up and interviewed this family that was so terrified they moved out of their house. They were living in a hotel trying to sell their home. And just recently, when I was doing an updated version of that story, I tried to contact the young man to see if he still felt like this was some sort of curse. And I couldn't get in touch with him because he was in prison again uh, with the bad luck continuing to uh, come after him. So there you have a very non-traditional sighting, whereas you know, somebody driving home late at night, seeing something scurry across the road in a very fast manner, much different than believing you've been cursed because of your sighting. Right. So that's a very, it's just bizarre, but it's, it's not unusual uh, to, for bad luck to follow people that, that have encountered these things. So yeah, it's, it's just uh, unusual to think about that there might be lifelong residual effects you know, from seeing one of these things, but that's, that's not altogether unheard of. And we all know that when somebody sees or experiences something outside of their realm of normal, whether it changes their belief systems or not, it really has a lifelong effect on a lot of them that they start to notice other things happening or other phenomena starting to appear. So, Sometimes when these witnesses report something, it's just the beginning of their journey. Right. It's called the hitchhiker uh, effect. And it's where, you know, a a Bigfoot witness will come home and in the days that follow that they'll start seeing UFOs or have poltergeist activity in their homes and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. I I think that that's a lot more common at all. Yeah. It's a lot more common than people think. Uh, it, It is really odd. Right. I mean, um, there have been multiple people that, that I've I've interviewed, and so has Barton. And we've compared notes. You know, the people see something on the side of the road, and it just seems like an innocuous thing. Like, oh, I saw this this weird creature, but then a bunch of weird stuff happens afterwards. And I'm always fascinated, not just with Bigfoot sightings, but other cryptids of people that report almost as though they've walked into a zone of fear, and a rational fear comes over them. And for a lot of them, even if they're in the presumed safety of a vehicle where they could technically drive away at any time they wanted, they really get a sense that if they don't leave, something bad's going to happen. And it's not the same kind of fear witnesses tell me, like if you're out hiking and you see a black bear or a moose, which are, you know, scary when you're out in the woods, but it's a different type of fear, almost like a primal fear that uh, you shouldn't be in the area. Yeah, and in a lot of, you you have done a lot of work on the Wendigo, uh, and that was something I wanted to touch on because that particular legend or or you know that is something that automatically would cause you to be um, terrified, and you would think that that would bring a curse with it, and but you don't get that so much with Sasquatch. People don't assume uh, that hey, if, if something if I see this or if you know there's no, there's no curse like per se that's just like standard across the board whereas wendigo literally is a curse in and of itself but it's like two different things but they're really not and do you think that there's a connection i don't know if either one of you guys i've I've thought this before though that there's a connection to these creatures with wendigo dogman bigfoot they're all connected in some way chad what are your thoughts on that i think they're all in that form of a trickster type uh 
a phenomenon. Whereas the Wendigo, today, there are many cultures who still refuse to even say its name. That if you utter its name, it puts you on its radar, that then it comes looking for you type thing. And I'll give you a quick example that I like to share. I was in northern Minnesota uh, doing a presentation for a local high school on mysterious creatures of Minnesota. And it was right near the reservation up there. And before the program, two elders from the tribe came up to me and said, we heard you're going to be talking about a specific monster up here. They didn't say Wendigo, of course. And they said, we'd appreciate it if you don't mention it. Don't say it at all. Completely bring it out of your program. So I said, sure, no problem. I'm a guest. I'll take it out. And those words had no sooner left my mouth than I noticed their body language all of a sudden just softened and relaxed. That as soon as they knew I wasn't going to say anything about the Wendigo, it's like the fear just dissipated from them and they could finally relax that that's how scared they were that I was just going to mention the monster near where they lived. Here's the thing I wanted to throw out there. And the reason I brought that up and a lot of people would be, you know, listening would probably say, what is the connection between Dogman, Wendigo and Bigfoot? I'll t- I'll tell you what I think and, and, and just very briefly, but I want to know what you think, Chad. Do you think that maybe the Wendigo is 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 associated with Bigfoot like the, their idea of this ice creature monster that comes you know from the cold i mean and and it is it possible that they some of these uh, native tribes like they they associate the Genosqua, the Gugwe, the Skookum, the Sasquatch whatever you whatever their name is that that is the Wendigo to them because there are there are legends going way back of cannibal giants is that possible that that's the connection there? Of course, uh, you know, speaking of every tribe and even among tribes had different variations of their beliefs, but a lot of the old legends and lore of the Wendigo put it distinctly separate from any other beast. And there were reports of, you know, what we would consider the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot that natives, uh, indigenous people and the First Nations people in Canada were reporting, but the Wendigo with its traditional lore was something altogether different because not only was it thought to be able to come to you in a flesh and blood manner, something that you could fight and possibly kill, but it also had the ability to come at you in spirit form and possess you and slowly turn you into a Wendigo. And shamans could bring about a Wendigo to attack a warring tribe or a village that they were in a disagreement with that the Wendigo could come and possess people or even drive away game so that anybody would starve. And then the Wendigo would come at you because it would often attack when you were at your weakest, whether it was physically, mentally, or spiritually, you know, when game was nowhere to be found and food was scarce, people were resorting to cannibalism that's when the Wendigo would show up and it could slowly turn you into one. So I think it was quite different in the early folklore, but today's Wendigo is much different than what they would have reported 400 years ago. And you think that because there was, you know, in, in those days, in the old days, that famine was a lot more common, that the fear of the Wendigo went hand in hand with, you know, crop failure, bad winter, things like that. I mean, is that, is that, Correct. Yes, it's thought to be the embodiment of uh, a famine season or winter, cold, ice, uh, desperation. Um, and what's interesting is we have cases where people actually starve to death rather than go out of their lodging because they merely heard a windigo was in the area. Nobody had seen it. Nobody had encountered it. But the Word was that there's one in the area. So rather than venture out to, for food and game and gathering you know, nourishment, people starved in their lodging because that's how afraid of the Wendigo they were. There was really nothing in indigenous and First Nations peoples that scared them as much as a Wendigo. And you don't, and you don't believe that the, maybe the Wendigo could be a form of Sasquatch. You're pretty sure that that's not. They they knew the difference. Well, between... how do you how do you differentiate Chad? Yeah, according to legend. So if you saw a Wendigo, 
how would you know that it's a Wendigo that you were seeing and not a Bigfoot or a Dogman or, or whatever? Is there yes. A well, I could look about it. Yeah, the Wendigo had a, a look. Obviously, it could be big, as big as it wanted. Uh, it was said that it would only walk in straight lines because nothing could stop it. Why wouldn't it walk in straight lines? But the original lore of the Wendigo was a very tall, very thin, almost skeletal, really gaunt, um, flesh pulled over its muscle, thin muscle, very tight. Sometimes it was missing its own mouth or lips because... It had an insatiable hunger for human flesh, and when no prey was available, it would consume its own body. So it really looked like what you might think of the early vampire legends of this almost skeletal zombie-like figure walking about, you know, the embodiment of cold and ice, where today most people that contact me about believing they've seen a Wendigo, it has antlers on it. Because the modern interpretation of the Wendigo comes complete with giant elk-like antlers on top of its head, which, again, is not in the earliest literature and lore of the Wendigo. That came about back in the 1940s, really, um, and then has really uh, uh, come about in the last couple decades, much like mimicking people's voices, that the early lore of the Wendigo was said that if you heard his voice, you would freeze with fear. You wouldn't be able to move, and then it really could come and attack you easier because its voice would stop you in its tracks. But over the decades, more and more people and media and TV shows have portrayed the Wendigo as mimicking human voices to try to lure you into the woods. So that has become what a lot of people contact me about saying, you know, I was out hunting with my buddy and I heard him yelling for me and I couldn't find him, looked all over. And when we got back to camp, he said he was, you know, miles and miles away, never said a word to me. So they believe it was the Wendigo. And I think it illustrates how folklore morphs and progress that, you know, legends a hundred years ago are probably different than today. Whether the creatures are, I don't know, but the legends are. And someone told me, re- well, didn't tell me, but recently they, they, they had said that they thought that Wendigo was a Bigfoot wearing a- an antler, like a deer antlers or, or deer head, like a skull over their face. What do you, what do you think of that? Um, it quite could be. Now, I usually, uh, with my research, I found that, you know, they seem to be distinct creatures and People often think that a Wendigo could be a Sasquatch that's turned cannibalistic, but really the Wendigo isn't cannibalistic. It's more of a hunter. It will eat people and turn them into cannibals, but usually doesn't consume one of its own. And I think uh, the late Grover Krantz did a great job in his book, Big Footprints. Uh, What was it? The Scientific Inquiry into the Reality of Sasquatch. That one. He had a great paragraph where he put the difference between what he thought was the Wendigo and the Sasquatch. And I don't know, his book, that was out a long time ago. So he was ahead of the the crowd when he was talking about he believed the Sasquatch was distinctly different than reports of the Wendigo. But again, at least in my mind, it's all speculation. I don't know. It's quite possible they're all the same thing. And it it seems to be kind of universal too. Like a lot of a lot of Native American tribes have a form of a Wendigo, or a form of a Skinwalker, which is also, I mean, you know, if you get down to brass tacks, they are distinctly different things. Skinwalker term being like Navajo, but there are a lot of tribes that have a shapeshifter. You know, they they believe that they're shapeshifters. Um, Got a story from from a, a Choctaw tribal police uh, that told me he saw his great uncle uh, near, near a pawn shop one one night. He was doing his rounds and he saw him. You know, he was going from one side to the other of this this area, and uh, his great uncle and he he saw this creature that looked like a werewolf. And then a couple of days later, his great uncle, who was considered to be a very evil man and who was also considered to be a suspect in the disappearance of his great aunt. And so the family had kind of shunned him that they believed that he had been practicing uh, black magic, like dark arts, whatever. 
And um, he told us this. We were, we were hanging out at a bar at a casino, and we, we were talking. And, and I talked to this guy and me and a couple of my uh, people from my team, my friend, you know. And we asked him a couple questions about that story, you know, because he had sent it to me. Well, he said that his great uncle told him, I saw you the other night. And he was like, really? And he was thinking, I didn't, I hadn't seen you in, you know, in a long time. And he saw him at the gas station. He said, yeah, you did. You saw me. I was over there by the pawn shop. And <laughs> it was like, I think, I think he was coming home or whatever. That's what it was. And he, when he walked right, right in front of his vehicle is what it was. Yeah. Um, but it, it was just crazy. He was like basically putting him on notice that that was him, you know? And so it, that being a shapeshifter story, obviously, if that's, you know, to be believed that, that that's possible, you know, and it just, it blew my mind when he told us that. Cause I was like, wow. So that basically is saying, Hey, that was me. Um, uh, but it, uh, now that a shapeshifter in, in the native American belief as opposed to a Wendigo. Now, Wendigo is not a shapeshifter, right? That doesn't, that doesn't. Well, that's the tricky part is the Wendigo was said to have the ability to change shapes that it could often appear as a mysterious black dog coming into an area or an owl. And if it wasn't the owl, the owl was acting as a spy for the Wendigo. And so a lot of Wendigo were also said to be accompanied by dogs which is very fascinating because they were thought to be able to morph into them as well. But not only did they have them as maybe a companion or a guard ship, but there are tales of Wendigo dogs fighting other dogs uh, in the villages and tribes, both indigenous and non-indigenous people. And um, I, I thought that was fascinating as well, the whole uh, dog aspect uh, to the Wendigo. And to your earlier point that, so many different peoples, both, again, First Nations and non-First Nations, spread across thousands of miles, all believed in similar creatures, even though they were separated by harsh terrain, uh, languages, different beliefs, sometimes warring factions. So it wasn't like they were telling, swapping stories with people 3,000 miles away. So it makes you wonder, what were these people experiencing if they're all seeing the same thing? You know, 400 years before Google made it easier for us to share these legends with one another. Yeah, and they could very much be isolated from one another for a long periods of time. So they wouldn't they wouldn't have been exchanging stories. Here's another thing too. Now, I've also thought of this. This is something that I've been, that's been thrown at me before by by different researchers and listeners of the show, and just I, I get all kinds of you know postulating on theories. But it's something that I wondered too. Now, it seems like there's some sort of evil spirit attached to this Wendigo type phenomena that can take form in, like what you just said. It's it sounds like it can take form in many different like like uh, ways. And I've al I've often wondered if like maybe the Dogman, uh, the Wendigo, these Skinwalkers, it, whatever you want to call them, big Bigfoot of of different types if they could be like empty vessels, kind of like uh, an evil spirit, uh, someone, a shaman that practices can inhabit these bodies and use them whichever way they want. Like whether it's an, an owl that is, you know, just some sort of creature, like a familiar, a cat, a, a dog, you know, like a black dog, like old Chuck or the Cadejo, as they say in Spanish. Matia would always talk about the Cadejo. She was terrified of it. It's like a curse, you know. Um, but I've always wondered about that. Like if there, if there may be, if there's some sort of way that these creatures can inhabit the, the, their bodies can be used or, or look, or the eyes can be looked through by an, an evil practitioner or demons, you know, like a, a disembodied demon can use them. And, and of course there's, there's a theory that these things are the Nephilim, you know, that they have been. Uh, that they were after the, 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 you know, they were around the antediluvian period. Then when the deluge came, then they were, you know, di they died. According to the book of Enoch, they became spirits for all evil spirits for all time. Um, and these bodies, these, these, that they inhabit, these, these creatures, they could be a metaphysical thing. They could come from the inner earth. I, I've, I've, there's all kinds of theories, but could it, po could it be possible, you know, that the, what we're dealing with are, Evil, evil spirits that inhabit these uh, creatures. 
because sometimes you'll get stories of Bigfoot with red eyes and, and they're just in a rage for no reason, throwing rocks at cars, attacking, you know, just, you know, you get stories of goat man, you know, you get these weird, like, like accounts of a goat man type creature just running up, up and attacking a car in particular, like Maryland has like a bunch of legends of goat man. And so I've, I've, I've often wondered that, like if there was something evil behind this, um, you know, like kind of pulling the strings, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I know we, me and Barton, we were talking about Rose, the late Rosemary Ellen Guiley's book, The Jin Connection, and then, of course, the book, uh, The Vengeful Jin. And she kind of proposes theories, you know, and, and, and that these things could be what's behind all these things. These these creatures are all part of the same soup or whatever different, you know, like different between the chicken noodle soup and chicken rice, you know what I mean? But they're still the same soup. It's just different flavors. You know what I'm saying? Like, and maybe that's what we're dealing with. And maybe the Wendigo, that's why these tribes that were separated, like the Shoshone and the Cheyenne and the Comanches, they all have some sort of connection, you know, because supposedly they were all originally from the same tribe up north. And then the the Cheyenne settled in one region and the Comanches went further down and settled in another region. And some believe that even the Aztecs, they settled, that they just kept going and they settled in another region and that they're genetically very similar. And of course, we know that the Aztecs uh, committed human sacrifice on a massive scale and they practiced cannibalism on a massive scale. And no one in history has done it the way that they did it before or since. But when you look at like some of their legends, like Zolotl, you know, he was like a, a guardian of the underworld. He was a dog headed deity. And then you get like these legends from the Navajo of the shapeshifter skinwalker can be an antelope or a, or a coyote. But typically it was a, a werewolf type creature that was it was used to terrorize people. And the the Cheyenne had these legends. They all have legends of these Wendigo type creatures. The Shoshone and the Rapaho, same thing. And and the Utes, you know, they live in fear of this Skinwalker. You know, the curse from the Navajo. When you look at all this to get when you when you take it all together and you look at a map, you're right, Chad. I mean, they're all separated from from each other hundreds of miles, but they all have the same legends. So even if there was a particular uh, route. Like it was all rooted in one particular, you would think that over time, over the hundreds of years that they were separated, the decades and whatever, and distance, that the legends would change drastically, but they really didn't. They kind of stayed at their core, sort of the same. And that says something because if you're looking at like, you know, some of these tribes having not seen each other or dealt with each other for, for a long time, you know. And then they still have sort of the same common core belief. It, it, it says it says something, you know. It's very interesting. Um, you know, the Kiowa the, in particular, they had a totem, a deity that was like a raven and, and a wolf. And when you look at like the way that they revered those those creatures, was like they had this mystical ability. And you didn't know when dealing with one of them if you were dealing with like some sort of shamanistic magic or if it was a real flesh and blood creature. Like the lines were blurred, you know what I mean? Yeah, I really enjoy the theory that there's you know one thing behind all of this, uh, especially when you start seeing how they almost project themselves to our perception differently for different people. Where I'm sure you've talked to people where a carload of people might see something, but several of them see something entirely different or significantly different than other people in the same car as though they're picking up on something different than their buddy where you would think if this creature was out there you know standing there it was pink polka dot everyone would see it the same exact way and this continues on with a lot of ufo research as well that we find lots of times witnesses are reporting what seem to be different experiences and maybe even different creatures. So I'm fascinated by that as well as uh, do they have the ability to af affect our human perception and the way we actually see or what we think we see, uh, feel, smell, hear, et cetera. That was actually something I was going to ask. That's, that's actually was something I was going to ask you, Chad, because I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this. And I've talked to a lot of other researchers about it. 
it's a conversation I've had with Linda. I've had this with Barton. I've had it with 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 a bunch of other of our colleagues. Um, most recently, Josh Ninocchio and, and I and Barton. I don't know if you remember Barton. We had like a four hour conversation about this. Um, and, right. And, yeah, and Josh has the show "What Lurks Beneath," but he 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 watches my show. Which is flattering, considering he's got like three million views on all of his shows or whatever. <laughs> but uh, he likes my show, and he was at my conference. And one of the things that we 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 came up with, it, it's really interesting. I did a I did a story uh, on Her- Her- Hernandez Ranch. It's not the real name of it, but it's it's a place here in Central Texas, down in South Central Texas. And I I wondered about this because there were four individuals who were all of Hispanic descent. And they were, well, they were all Mexican and they were part of that family of the Hernandez family. They were with a a African-American guy, uh, a Caucasian guy and a Caucasian female. They, the four, I think there were four, maybe five, I think counting there was a, there was a younger adult too. They were all there together. Well, long story short, the, the, the Mexican people, they saw what looked like these two werewolf looking dog man creatures, hambre lobos, as we would call them in Spanish. And they were up on the bank and they saw them and they were like, dude, look, look, they're right there. Well, the white people and the black pe- person did not see them. Like they did not see what they were. They were like, what is, what are you pointing at? The one f- white female, she saw what looked like blur, like a blur. She said it looked like a, a blurry blob. That's all she could make out. Kind of like how people describe cloaking, and to me, it was very telling that four of the individ of the, I think it was four out of the five individuals that were Hispanic all saw the same thing, but yet the 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 non Hispanic people that were not part of that family did not see what they were seeing, and these creatures just kind of went back into the into the woods. Uh, so you know, it's it's it's, I mean, same thing with La Llorona. Like when you hear about La Llorona, I mean, like I had a, a friend who he married a Dominican woman, him and his brother, they were out on the lake in San Gabriel. They saw La Llorona. I mean, it was literally floating across the water. They could see this, this image of this woman. Uh, my mother and my uh, aunt claimed to have seen it when they were kids and near the same area near a place called Hoxie, which was notoriously haunted a place here in central Texas. And they saw this thing, but yet his wife didn't see it. And so when I talked to this guy, I said, it could be sangre, you know, like the blood. It's in the blood. Like it's in your brain and, you're, and you know, and, and, and it's in your blood. But it's only something that, that you see if you are literally of Mexican descent. And like his wife, she, she's Dominican. She had no clue what he was looking at, which is really weird. And now I trace that legend of La Llorona. I traced it back to the siege of Tenochtitlan whenever the Aztecs were were finally losing because the Spaniards and their allies, and of course the Spaniards had allied several tribes against them, the Tlaxcalans and the Tabascans, and they were sick and tired of being, you know, preyed upon by the the Aztecs who were using them as, as human sacrifice. So that it was easy for the Spaniards to get them to help them, because it was only about six seven hundred Spaniards that that took that city. And that sounds amazing, but not as amazing when you when you think about it. It was their Indian allies that, that did a lot of the, the, the work. Uh, the Spaniards just used cannons and horses and fe- made them fear. That being said, the, the Spaniards, they, they, they were terrified. There was a woman all night long that was wailing just for, for like three days straight. All she did was wail, my children, my children, we are lost. All is lost. My children, my children, we are lost. And there was a Spanish monk who chronicled that the the, the last days of the siege, and it was the, the, it was smoke and fire and the smell of blood and death was everywhere. But this woman's wailing could be held by could be heard by both sides, and it and it made a lot of the uh, Spaniards' allies very uneasy. They they almost pulled away because they thought that she was putting a curse upon them. I believe, and this is a theory I have, that these. That that right there was the beginning of the La Llorona legend, and it just spread throughout Mexico, like everywhere. Like it was, it was everywhere. Before you knew it, it was like you know, it was in you know Coahuila, it was in Chihuahua, it was you know in Guerrero, all these different places. Like you know, and and the legend just spread. Oaxaca, you know, wherever you're from, it was like oh, there's La Llorona, 
because uh, La Llorona, she she wails, my children, my children are lost. I, I lost my children. So in in the Mexican psyche, they created a story that, that where this this comes from. But it, it is that there was a woman who was with a man. And he didn't want kids, so she she drowned she drowned her kids in, in in the river. She took her kids to the river or whatever local body of water. It's an urban legend. And then she she killed them so she could be with his man. Then it's like, oh, I no longer have kids. And then he's like, I don't want you. And then she killed herself. <clears throat> Which is, you know, when you go back and you you read the 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 stories of the woman wailing at the siege of Tenochtitlan, that to me was the beginning of that. Now, could that have been like a patrica, like a curse, something that was placed upon those of Spanish descent, um, you know, or Mexican descent? Because a lot of the the Mexicans, the Aztecs, were pretty much wiped out over the next fifty years. They were just completely wiped out of existence, so that the Indians that were left which are the Mexican people now have that curse upon them. So they have this story of the La Llorona and they see La Llorona. That is what I think could be going on with that. And I think that maybe these things appear to certain individuals, like just like the Jin in the, in, in the Middle East, you have, you know, like the, 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 the Arabs are just in terror of these, the Jin that there's absolutely in terror but if you go to Ireland, it's the same thing with the fae or the fairies. You know, don't kick that mound because that's where the fairies live. That's their that's their home. A curse can be put upon you or brought upon you. And and I'm I'm wondering like that same thing with these the Native Americans. And of course, you know, with Bigfoot, you, you were talking about how people have encounters with the Bigfoot and then all kinds of weird stuff happens. I wonder if it's more pronounced depending upon the tribe. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's a fascinating topic. And I remember years back, 20 plus years ago, when I first joined the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON. I mean, back then it was, if more than one person saw a UFO together, you'd separate them, interview them. And, you know, all these researchers would say, I interviewed four people. They all said the same exact thing. They were seeing the same thing, same colors, same sound, everything. So, there must be a lot of credibility to it because they all saw the same exact thing unbeknownst to one another. Where today, I think that as we were just talking, I think that has shifted that skeptics might say that it makes it less likely to be believable. But I think the exact opposite, that I think we're right on the track here that different people experience things differently. And I, I did my master's thesis in psychology on students' belief in the paranormal, and I was looking at uh, belief systems and human perception, how that affects your belief or experience in the paranormal. So I, I think we're right on the, hitting this on the head here. Right. Uh, so I've all, always thought yeah, that all of these uh, unexplained phenomena, you know, UFOs and ghosts and, you know, Bigfoot, cryptids, what they call cryptids, which I don't agree with that term at all, but... I've always thought that they could be merely different manifestations springing from the same evil source. I have to call it evil because that's what it is. You know, it, it seems like it's just, it feeds on fear. All these things feed on fear. And the ones that are actually uh, causing physical harm to people seem like they're out for blood. And you know how important blood is in, in uh, satanic rituals and things like that. So I'd become across a lot of, uh, ritualistic type behaviors in some of these locations that you've been um, researching for all these years. Particularly Obviously, I, yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of these places, whether they're you know alleged to be haunted or have some monster running around, you know, a lot of people gather there, especially younger people, and it's evidenced by the amount of graffiti everywhere and beer cans uh, thrown about. But often on a lot of these places, they're thought to be places of of mystery. That the place them the place itself is the the trigger, if you will. So uh, there are so many places where it's alleged there's occult activity going on there because just like curious legend trippers, you know those who practice uh, what some might consider the dark arts, you know they're drawn to these places of significance as well. Right, and most particularly uh, ones with certain names, 
and we, we both know what that's called, the name game. Oh, yeah. Lauren mm-hmm. Coleman wrote about that really, really uh, well in Mysterious America. So certain places with, with you know particular names have a lot more high strangeness events happen than other places that don't. Like Devil's Backbone. That's the place here in Texas. Right, any there. devil name. <laughs> and yeah, any name with devil. But there's also other, other you know, more common names that are associated with it. Where you think that, you know, uh, as many Smith and Jones as that are, there are in the United States that would be the most uh, people with that name that, that experience these things. But it's, it's really not, you know. What do you mean, Barton? Like, <clears throat> are you talking about like like Taylor, Michigan, Taylor, Mississippi, Taylor, Texas? They're all they well, all have dog names. So, mm-hmm. right, Champlain and uh, another uh, devil name uh, that's particularly hot would be Hobbs or something like that. You know, something has to do with uh, supernatural connotations. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts well, on that, Chad? Chad? Has written about that. Yeah, I agree with Barton. Warren Coleman did a fantastic job and kind of following up on. In, in some ways, John Keel's window areas theory of these things are, you know, almost supernatural portals of some sort that, and people pick up on it, whether it's the first indigenous people or back when the pioneers came through or the missionaries, they all could pick up on these, these areas where something just wasn't quite right. And, uh, you know, when you read Lauren's take on it, it's just fascinating, especially when you start to get into the name game where, you might have a witness coming out that has the same last name as a, you know, a place name from 50, 80 years ago. Uh, it just the coincidence of it or the synchronicity of it, maybe even a better term is uh, very fascinating. And it's one where a lot of researchers don't look into that. You know, we're looking uh-huh. into more of the, the sexiness of the cases where sometimes, you know, some of these uh, more mundane um, details are left behind. Yeah, I think one of the right. issues well, that they're, they're trying to fit a narrative, yeah, they're fit a narrative, to, yeah, uh, fit a narrative, yeah, that's what they're doing, and they just ignore the the strange aspects of any given phenomenon, like the dog yeah. man or the Bigfoot. You know, most Bigfoot researchers believe that's a strictly flesh and blood animal that you know it's you know evolved from Gigantopithecus blacky, and if you say, well, these things can turn invisible right in front of your eyes, or they can speak to you telepathically, then they automatically shut down and what you you say no longer matters, right? So it doesn't fit their narrative. So they discount that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, well, most of the researchers are, are guilty of this. So it's really it's really a shame that everyone just doesn't get to, to tell the truth and people can listen to that, you know, and have a choice between listening to that or listen to this narrative that people have been uh, spoon feeding us for the last 50 or 60 years. Compartmentalization. Yeah, I'd, love, yeah. I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on when you get these cases where it seems like a, a traditional a sighting, if there is such a thing, of any of these creatures, but then there's something so bizarre that the witness is almost hesitant to report it because nobody will believe it. You know, it's that, again, where it's almost as though there's something happening where, okay, we can have this sighting of this thing, but if we throw this in, nobody, everyone will discount it. You know, it's just so bizarre. For instance, I had a a young girl, teenage girl that was at this place in Iowa called Terror Bridge, and it's thought to be haunted by a murdering mother. But anyway, there's a a werewolf or dogman-like story out there dating back to the 1800s, and she said as they were leaving, they saw this large wolf-like creature running upright on its hind legs, keeping up with the vehicle, even though they were tearing down the gravel road over 50 miles per hour. But then she said, I never told anybody about it because here's the odd thing. The creature was wearing a tweed like dinner jacket with those elbow pads like a professor might wear out of you know 1990s stereotypical college professor. And it was like a tweed jacket. And she said, I never told anyone because that can't be what I saw. You know, that can't be possible. Why would this be wearing it? So I'm curious. I always want to hear what other people think of uh, that strangeness that appears in some of these cases. Do you yeah, want to answer that first, Martin? <laughs> sure. It's definitely going on. And especially it's not, uh, you know, people have seen these creatures wearing clothing. Uh, it's not unheard of, but it's really rare. 
my own mother saw a dog man when she was uh, 10 years old here in Henderson County, Kentucky, and it was wearing a, a white, ripped up, dirty uh, T-shirt. So, yeah. And, huh. it's, these days, it's more if you, if you have something that's atypical to uh, anything a, a natural animal can, can do as far as ability uh, wise goes. You know, it's the cloaking that they, they just can't. You know, if you if you if you have a Bigfoot encounter and you turn it into a certain well-known Bigfoot organization, right? Which I did back when I first got online in 2005, concerning my own family's encounters in Spotsville. But if you if you turn in a regular Bigfoot encounter, there that's fine. But if you add that extra element that you know these things can turn invisible, or these things have can exhibit some form of mind control, or there was a UFO sighted just a few days before this in the same area, well, they automatically toss it out, Chad, right? They have no use mm-hmm. for it. So they're doing a, a, a huge disservice to everyone, even the people who don't believe that these things can do do all these, what they call woo uh, stuff. But every, I, we think that everyone should be able to get all the data presented in a straightforward, truthful manner and not worry about what so much about what people think. And, if people would just do that, then we could probably get a lot further, a lot quicker mm-hmm. than we're going right now. One of the things, Chad, I was going to tell you too. Um, I don't. We haven't talked a whole lot, so. Um, but I, I like I, Barton. We'll start with this. Barton has a story that he that you covered in your book in Humanoids, and I think that's one of the best. That to me, that's my number one. And I'm not saying that because Barton's on the air with me. I'm just Barton is book in humanoids. Oh, no, thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. And that was the number one book for me. And, and like Chad, you've written a lot of fascinating books too. I would encourage anyone to go out there and buy up both of these guys' books because they are. I'm a voracious reader in, anyway, and, and I'm like you guys. I read Lauren Coleman's book a long time. That you know, and you're talking about the name game and all that. I mean, um, and I, and I've spoken with Lauren too. And one of the things that I I, I believe. When when you look at the the game of hide and seek uh, in your book in Humanoids, where the where the child saw the werewolf looking creature wearing like a suit, and he looked like the big bad wolf, you know, and I covered a case not not like not a big bad wolf suit wearing whatever, but where there was a child that was interacting with this dog. I don't want to call it a dog man. It was like a werewolf, uh, and. It was playing nice and friendly, and the, you know the mother was getting pictures. And this is going to be in my book, um, drawing pictures of this creature, of this dog man type creature, or whatever. Um, and she was like, "This looks scary," you know. Even though the kid wasn't very old, the child's not very old. He's he's drawing pictures of this werewolf looking thing because it's on two legs. And he's, she's like, "What is that?" And he's like, "That that's my friend. He comes to the window and talks to me." Well, eventually she saw this friend and it freaked her out and she was carrying the laundry and she heard him talking away and she's like, who are you talking to? And she looks into the room and there's this thing looming through the window. And I've talked about this before on on my show because it's just a case in point. Like this is just to me the case that that shows you um, where this is all coming from, where this is at. We had gone to that place to, to talk to these people um, about this haunting. It was like a poltergeist activity. And now I knew them through some mutual friends. I didn't know them personally. I know who they were, but I wasn't like really familiar. They went to school like a town over. And so I knew who they were. And I, you know, we walk in there and a blender, like a ninja blender goes off. And then the washing machine was bouncing. And I was like, okay, this is more than Ike's, you know, this is not, and they were like, well, it doesn't happen all the time. I'm like, yeah, I know I lived in a house like that. And it was, it was almost like it was seasonal, like, okay, time to act up. And then it would stop for a while. Then it would do it again. And, but the, the, the fact that this dog man creature had been seen, not just by the child, but by the mother and then by her brother-in-law who stayed there temporarily with a friend of his, uh, and, and of course, you know, her husband was in the complete denial about everything until it culminated with something really bad happening. And it, it was, it, it, he was like, well, they were outside shooting guns and they were drunk. Well, they had been drinking and they were shooting guns and, and, and th- there was a hay bale that this thing had jumped over and they saw this creature. And so they took shots at it. Now that was in an, in a field near that, near this farm. 
Um, but these were grown adults and they were like, yeah, we had just gone out there and we had half a bottle of whiskey and we hadn't even really started, you know, we were just going to take a couple drinks, you know, and they were waiting for some friends to show up and they were going to leave. So they were shooting their, their uh, shotguns, just playing around. And they, this, the, the noise, I guess, stirred this creature up out behind a, the hay bale. Um, but the fact that those two adults had seen it and then the child had seen it and the mother had seen it when they were giving me the, 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 the rundown of this, the, the part about the dog man wasn't coming out. It was just, there was a haunting. They were the, the, the kids and the, and the, and the mother were admitting that they had seen the shadow man with like a hat, uh, which a lot of people will call the hat man. And then there was this, this creature that was showing up that wouldn't come in the house. Uh, it did eventually, but it wouldn't come in the house at first and it would just stay outside and talk to the, the child and would tell him to come outside. Now, good thing for him, he listened to his mom and dad and wouldn't go outside the house after dark. And he kept telling this creature, no, I can't, I can't play with you because it's – And but then this creature would always come at night and he was trying to get him to go outside. Well – that part was so fantastical to them that they had left that part out. And I was like, when they started to talk to me about that, it was only because her, her brother had, had, you know, had said, Hey, you know, when I was staying there, there was some, there was this creature that was, you know, that, that I saw in the field and he did not know about the, her, uh, subsequently his sister seeing this creature, now his brother in law was completely hostile to the idea. He was just like, nah, man, nah, he's drinks, and that's why he saw that. And I was like, Well, how do you explain your son seeing it? How do you explain your wife seeing it? And they were so uh apprehensive to talk about the entire phenomena. They were just talking about aspects of it. And I said, Look, it's all part of the greater whole. And when you'd get a case, you know, a lot of times the the you're you're only getting pieces of it. And that's a problem because you know, people, well, I'm going to write a book about, you know, dog man or Bigfoot, whatever. Then they get cases and they only talk when they, when they tell these people's stories, they're only talking about that part of the story. They're not asking the person, Hey, after you saw this Bigfoot in the middle of Mississippi, you know, in the woods or whatever, did you have some sort of weird haunting type activity happen near your house you know, did did anything happen beyond that? Were there UFOs? You know, did you have ghost activity in your life when you were growing up? No, they they totally dis disregard all of that, and they just focus on this person saw Bigfoot in 1987. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, that really speaks, I think, to the importance of the interviewer, because a lot of times when witnesses contact all of us, it's after the fact. They've already seen something or experienced something, and you're right that oftentimes, and maybe it's not even the fault of the interviewer that maybe they're not doing it on purpose, I, although I know some are actively not even curious about anything outside of their realm, but um, you know, you could have someone seeing a UFO and then ask if they've ever seen any other UFOs, and they'll say no, and then if you walk away... You know, if you would have asked if anything other strange things, and oftentimes you'll have a witness say, well, I didn't even think about this, but I saw a weird creature after it or, you know, had some haunted activity. And I think the alcohol part, when you were describing that too, I think that falls really directly into what we were just talking about, the the weirdness, the silliness of some of these things where so many people have contacted me about an experience that has happened after one or two drinks where, you know, obviously they're not intoxicated, uh, they're just uh, one or two drinks in, but yet they don't want to report it because they had been drinking. Where it almost seems like, again, you start drinking, and I had a, a friend, a colleague uh, years ago that was in, doing a lot of ghost and haunted homes research, and um, he would go in, and when a family was sitting down, you know, having a beer, watching the game while he was there trying to record some of the stuff, he would participate in the same thing they were doing, you know, having a drink. And, and I think uh, sometimes, you know, if we were to dis discount some of these stories because someone had one or two drinks, I think we'd be missing out on some really cool legends. And I always ask myself when I'm dealing with the weird, what's too weird? You know, where do you draw the line? Because if you draw the line, right. are vampires too weird? Chupacabras, are they too weird? And I think if you draw the line somewhere, you'll be missing out on a ton of stories. 
Yeah, I made that mistake with the LBL, and Barton knows about this. We have covered a lot of uh, ground on the LBL and the dogman uh, phenomena there and the attacks that have gone on. Um, interviewed bunches of people who've had incidents there. I had a story of a, bu- a bunch of teenagers who had gone near a cave right there in, in Kentucky, in, in Tennessee area, like the border. Um, and I discounted it because they were a bunch of teenagers and they had been drinking. And the guy was like, yeah, we were polishing off fireball. And I'm like, okay. You know, uh-huh. and so that automatically just, and when he, when they started talking about these werewolf looking creatures tr- coming after them and running at them and they got in their trucks and took off, I totally tossed that out. Now that was shame on me because I did, that was several years ago. And if, and if I would have known or had even the slightest inkling that there was so much activity in that area, that a, a colleague of mine later, like that I worked with on his show for, for years, about six years, I worked with this guy and he told me, Hey, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the LBL. And I had thrown that case by him and it was like, I, I had, I, but I couldn't, I just deleted the email. I just thought, this is silly, dude. These kids are a bunch of drinking. You know, I think the, the youngest kid was like 18 or something, 19. So they were they weren't kids. They were the early twenties, late you know, late t- college age kids. I guess is what they would. Um, but the but the fact that they were drinking, and you know, just just you know, admittedly that they had been drinking in a couple. Of, and I and I had messaged them and I said, was anybody else doing anything else? And they said, well, a couple of us were were stoned. You know, and I'm like, automatically right there, I was just <laughs> like, yeah. And, and then, but when you when you go back and then you compare the notes of what I remember from that report because I don't have it, um, and then going to what later on I uncovered from working with Barton and, and of course, Elijah Henderson and Johnny Henderson, the late Johnny Henderson from the Crypto Studies Institute. And then a, a witness that had come forward that we had, that had seen the attacks. And then of course, now there's Martin Groves with the police, the ex police officer, um, you know, and when you start comparing the notes to all these attacks and all these things, I'm going like, dude, I, I really wished I wouldn't have done that. And I've even appealed on the air to, on my show. Hey, if you were the person that sent me that story years ago, and if you're listening, please get back in touch with me, which, you know, I, I it, but at the time, you know, you, you get these reports and then there's reports you get that are kind of like a one-off. Um, I was talking about this with, with, uh, Lyle the other day about, you know, one-offs and, uh, you know, just putting them in a f- file because you never know later on, you'll get a story. And that's how, like with the vampire encounters that I've gotten and the gargoyle encounters, 90% of the time, people aren't coming to me and going like, hey, I saw a vampire. They're just telling me they saw some weird stuff. And I go, that sounds like a vampire. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't get the same press that the dog man does. But then there's all these different types of dog man, all these different types of Bigfoot. Why are we not categorizing and cataloging these different types of vampires? Like maybe these crawlers, these rake type creatures. What if those are basically a type of vampire? Like just like... Um, you get a gargoyle story, like people are giving me this story and I'm thinking leathery wings, it's gray, it's tall. I just called it a gargoyle because I didn't know what else to call it. But I did that. I Luckily, I'd held on to a report and then several years later, I got another one, two different sides of the country that matched the, the description almost identical. And then after coming forward with that, I had a childhood friend that, that, that I'd lived in this town in West Texas for a while and he came forward and said that him and his girlfriend and a buddy were running bleachers getting ready in the, in August getting ready for you know football and whatever and he was they were out there and they saw this gargoyle looking creature and I thought wow that's three three encounters three different parts of the country years apart from each other so yeah the importance of 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 not allowing the too weird to to interfere but I think a lot of researchers do that I'm not going to name names or accuse people but I know several people who've tried to interview me and or asked me for my story and wanted to tell me that what I saw was a Bigfoot or what I saw was a type of chupacabra or this or that and the other. And I'm like, no, dude, when I was 15 years old, I saw what looked like a werewolf. You want to call it a dog, man? Go ahead. I didn't even know what dog man was for years when I, after I saw that, I didn't know for 10 years what that was. Um, but you can call it what you want, you know, but that is the thing. Is it too weird? You know? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that the bat creatures that, yeah, I think we just call them bat squatch today. 
wolf. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the Bigfoot with wings. Wings, yeah. And I just, yeah, I got a, I got a report a couple of years ago, a really terrifying report of one of those. Yeah. So, Chad, let knows, me... there's no end. There's no end to this to what these things can manifest themselves as as far as appearance goes. And and Chad, I want to ask you about this. You're in Wisconsin. You're in the northern woods of Wisconsin, right? You set up in the north. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and of course, Linda, a, a mutual friend of all of ours, she she made the 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 dog man phenomenon famous. She was a journalist. You know, she wrote the Beast of Bray Road, and and then I think one of the best books about dog man werewolves, is hunting the American werewolf, which is still one of my personal favorites. But you, what do you, what are your thoughts on the dog man phenomenon? I mean, I mean, you're up there in dog man country. What what do you got going on with that? Well, let me concur that, you know, Linda Godfrey, uh, pioneer in the, the field. And the first time I ever went to Bray Road was with Linda. Uh, she gave me a, a tour of it. And, um, you know, I don't think there's anyone attached to a legend. Um, maybe John Keel and Mothman more than Linda is attached to, you know, the Beast of Bray Road or the Dogman and that. So that's a real feat, I think, on her part. Um, when no one was really talking about this, she was, uh, you know, there before, at least myself. Um, but yeah, uh, so I'm interested, like, for instance, um, up in Michigan, there is a small town, the smallest town in Michigan, a place called the Omar Plains, where they believe witchy wolves are hanging out. That's the name that they called them. But by all accounts, it would be, you know, somewhat of a dogman creature that was said in this particular legend out in the middle of nowhere, it was said to guard sacred burial grounds. And that if anything happened to these grounds, whether intentionally or you know, just by mistake or happenstance, that they would be released. And when I was there walking through the woods, you know, you got a sense that you didn't need a good imagination to feel like something could be there in the woods. And, I remember a gentleman was giving me a tour and he was an old timer from the community. And he said, you know, back in the fifties, he remembers it was a sort of lover's lane and that kids would go out there, but then the girls would come back complaining that the, some giant monster was ripping at their skirts and their, their legs. And, you know, they were coming back saying they were being attacked, but not by their teenage suitors, but by this wild monster. But they saw it as more, supernatural like having the ability to do things no flesh and blood creature could actually do and again we talked about this earlier where you know it's that that whole argument where you get people who are in the flesh and blood camp that won't listen to any other theory and then people who think it's metaphysical or you know interdimensional or what be it you know they're not listening where i don't know i i take it from the approach of I don't have any answers, so I'm willing to, you know, have these thought experiments where we look at so many different theories. And that's the way science kind of works. If we want to kind of uh, attach ourselves to any quasi-scientific method, you know, that's the way science works, comes up with a, a theory and tests it and see if it works or not. So I love these books, like Joshua Cutchins coming out with a ton of these books that are really throwing out a lot of theories that are just so fascinating. But in terms of, uh, you know, um, werewolves and dogmen creatures up here in the North, I, Linda, you know, once her books came out, they seem to be coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And have you had, like, have you interviewed uh, multiple people um, about the dogman phenomenon in Wisconsin or? Most of the people I interview in the Midwest, uh, they don't differentiate between, they've never heard of Dogman for one. So most of them, again, it comes down to interviewing them, that most of them say, I saw a large wolf-like creature. And, you know, for lack of a better term, they'll say, I guess I'd call it a werewolf. And then it's not until you start detailing all the specifics of their um, sightings where you can start to see what, what it falls into or, you know, the specifics of the, the sighting. But I think because all those of us in the field, you know, obviously no dog man stories, but the general public overwhelmingly, in my experience, they don't know. So again, if you're not going to dig in and really get the story down the way they tell it, 
I could see easily see how someone could throw these into one camp or the other based on their preference. Well, I think that the uh, the dog man phenomenon, like, okay, <laughs> and I've had a problem with this since day one. Like, I didn't, I wouldn't know what a dog man was until my brother, who lived in Michigan for a long time, he he was like, hey, that sounds like a dog man. When I told him the story. You know, and, and I, we were on the phone and I was just like, what is a dog, man? Well, when he came down to Texas and he and he ended up needing a place to stay and he he lived with me, I didn't know he was going to live meet with me for two decades. But anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my old, he's my older brother. Um, so he he told me, hey, this is like a dog, man. So him and an ex-girlfriend of mine, they started doing some some digging on the on the name dog, man, because we weren't getting a whole lot from werewolves. And I didn't. I wasn't a big internet guy. I was a, you know, a hard, you know, physical go get a book from the library guy. So I had done a lot of were researching on werewolves. And then in my hometown, I had done a lot of researching in, in the area uh, around my hometown and had come up with all kinds of stories from different people who had seen weird things. And, um, that was when I kind of first heard dog man. And that's how I found Linda and then later Vic, you know, and then I reached out to Ken Gerhardt and then, you know, the rest is history. I just started doing this stuff, you know, just, just researching, just full blown, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And then, you know, reach, reaching out to other uh, people like Barton and Nick and, uh, you know, Lyle. And I just kind of went down the rabbit hole with all these different theories. Touching on what you said, though, is very interesting. Uh Chad and Barton, both of you, about one of about these creatures having um, wearing clothing. I did a story on another show. I, it, I I covered it on on another show, and it was a friend of mine's grandmother who claimed to have seen a man laying underneath a railroad car that was like kind of defunct, and it was like there's a railroad interchange in my hometown because it's full of co it's cotton land, and the railroads were just the cotton gins would be pumping. And the cotton would be getting loaded up on these trains and going back and forth, east, west, north, south, whatever, because there's just so much of it. And the streets would be littered with cotton during cotton season, you know. But she saw this guy that was laying underneath a railroad car, and he was wearing like a an overcoat. And when she came out of Taylor Cafe, which is right there, right, right there by the railroad interchange, she went to get some barbecue. She walks out. It's like an iconic place. It's been there for over 100 years. But she walked out and she saw what looked like a werewolf with that same guy's clothing laying underneath the railroad car like it was asleep. And I've covered that story, you know, years ago. But it was so weird. You know, and she told us this when I was like, I don't think I was probably like 16 or something, maybe the year after I had seen what I saw. Um, my My – Fourth cousin had seen the same thing I saw uh, when I was – the year that I saw what I saw. And then a couple of my friends that lived in between uh, uh, my hometown and another hometown were driving through the, through the country, and they saw this weird-looking wolf-like creature come out of a field. And that was, that was in December after the, after the October what I saw. Um, but you know, when she told me that story, because we were talking about what I had seen, her grandson had seen something uh, in an area near uh, Hidalgo Park that was really, really weird. I'm not going to get into the whole case, but um, they they heard these things, like these three black dogs that jumped out onto the road. They were speaking Spanish because they and they thought that they were uh, Mexican nationals that were laying in the grass by the railroad, you know, cars. Um, and they thought they were workers, you know, people that would load the the cotton onto the trains. And lo and behold, there's these three black wolf-like creatures that jump out onto the road. And one of them stood up and walked upright and walked across the road. So when we were comparing notes and talking about my encounter and my friend that was with me, who's now a preacher in my hometown, that saw the thing I saw, we were all there. His granny began telling us, now they're African-American, they call it the haint. And she said, I saw one of these haints. It looked like a man laying underneath a railroad car. I went in there to get me some some barbecue, and I come back out, and there's this wolf-like creature with that same man's clothing underneath, and it, like the clothing was all tore up. Like, it, like you know, he like 
it, it, it sounded almost like he was drunk or something and he passed out and then he shapeshifted into, I mean, this, if the story is to be believed the way she told it, she wasn't laughing. She was a very no nonsense guy and her son and my dad grew up together and they worked at the local grocery store together. So when they were young, but it was weird. Like she said that it was like this werewolf was there instead of the guy. And we, it just freaked me out because I, at that point in time, I didn't know if what I had seen was a shapeshifter or if it was a demon. My friend's mother was always like, el diablo, the diablito, you know, and she would always describe it as a demon. And before she passed, she told her story, her version of the story because she saw it in the window because it followed us home. She told my brother and three of my friends and they were like, wow, this is crazy. But uh, this thing didn't have any, the one I saw didn't have any clothing or anything like that. And I know recently um, I was discussing this with Ken Gerhardt when we were interviewing people for my book. Uh, one of the witnesses, Carrie Eaton, described seeing clothing being folded in the woods. And then she sees this werewolf-like creature, which she's convinced was literally a biker. <laughs> That's what, I mean, and if you go back and you listen to the show, she, I've interviewed her. And uh, we interviewed her for the book, but th that's crazy. Those kind of stories, right there, it lends credence to that the, there could be more than you know than what we think is going on here. Like, um, you know, how many of those kind of reports have you fielded, Chad? And and with from your where you're at, your neck of the woods. Those are the type that really pique my interest because. You know, I deal with, yes, uh, mysterious creatures, but also UFOs and haunted places, crop circles and the like. You know, I kind of run the entire spectrum. So I'll get a lot of, even when it comes to Bigfoot, I'll get a lot of the similar type stories of seeing something big, you know, moving across the road or what be it. You know, it's a fleeting experience, maybe a couple seconds or UFOs, a bright light in the sky, but then it vanishes. Not much you can do. Uh, with it, you get so many of them, but the ones that really stand out are the ones where there's something odd to it. For instance, there was a woman driving home uh, up in the UP of Michigan, and she was driving home and slowed down because she thought something, uh, raccoons or something were digging through her uh, neighborhood garbages. And she saw it, and then when she slowed down almost to a stop, this thing peeked up and it looked what you might consider like maybe the chupacabra or the picture she drew kind of looks like the Enfield horror of this giant eared, huge saucer like eyes of this pinkish color. And it was rummaging through eating the garbage. And her first thought was um, that this thing was telling her without speaking, obviously that how can you see me? You're not supposed to see me. You know, she really got the feeling that this thing was surprised that she knew it was there. And again, she was in the safety of her vehicle, but she sped home, like terrified. And like a lot of witnesses, it's not until later when they calm down and relax and the fear kind of subsides and the adrenaline uh, drops out of their system where they start to think that was really weird. I wish I would have stayed there to see it. But at the time, you know, leaving is so important. But uh, she drew this really cool, uh, looks like a half chupacabra half Enfield horror monster uh, lurking about in the garbage cans. But what really intrigued me was that fact that she felt it told her, you're not supposed to see me, which, which I love because obviously that comes into a lot of UFO and ufology and abduction research of, you know, false memories and uh, screen memories and people being told that they're, you know, you don't remember this kind of thing. So that's what really uh, piques my interest. Wow. That's, man. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Barton? So bizarre. Everything's so bizarre these days and just keeps getting more so. It, it seems, you know, the longer we go, right, looking into this stuff. But so I just want to tell everybody, I know we're getting low on time, but Chad is one of the authors that I love to buy his books and read them myself. And matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I was, me and Letitia was just up in uh, Illinois going to the Garden of the Gods. We stopped in this little gift shop and uh, to get a Coke and a candy bar or whatever. And there was this bookshelf, and there was two or three of Chad's books on there. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I'm just, I'm just going to go buy these books. And so I bought the books and got them home. And 
was really surprised and pleased to see that they were signed. So that was cool. But I wanted to ask you, Chad, I know we're we're running low. Have you ever seen or experienced any of these uh, monsters for yourself and all of your travels? I know you've been everywhere. Um, I guess the short answer would be no, knock on wood, unfortunately. Um, You know, I think the closest I would have is maybe uh, some sea serpent research where there was maybe something which I probably think was a lateral wave or um, something else. But I I would say, you know, 5% chance that was a, a lake monster. But so the short answer is no. You know, I've been researching all over the world, thousands of places, and yet, you know, again, it comes back to, yet here we have someone like myself who does all this stuff and no experiences, and then someone else who doing the same thing, multiple experiences. It it makes me really think there's something more than just whether you're out there looking for it or not, that there's some other criteria or some other factors that play into who has these things and who doesn't. Right. Well, I, if it makes you feel any better, Chad, I've been on scores and scores of expeditions here in Kentucky. And every time I walked out the door with the intentions of getting evidence or, or something like that, nothing happens. I don't find anything. But, but when I go mm-hmm. out fishing or hunting or looking for arrowheads, suddenly something happens. So it's almost as if, Whatever's behind all this stuff knows what exactly what you're doing, you know, and you can't hardly mm-hmm. outsmart that. So every time I've ever gone out to to get gather information or, or have an experience, I've never it's never happened. Only when I'm not ready and you know, having something totally else, something else totally on my mind and not thinking about unexplained phenomena or Bigfoot or anything like that, water monsters or anything like that. And then suddenly there's something swimming across the Ohio river right at you. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you say, unfortunately you haven't had any experience. Well, it might be to your fortune that you haven't. Yeah. Seen. Fortunately. Yeah. 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 I think you're right because so many people that contact me, uh, you know, they're not researchers. They're not even interested in the paranormal. Sometimes they just happen to be out experiencing something that they can explain and they're not actively out trying for it. Um, you know, they're right. just going about their, their daily business. Chad, let me ask you this. Are you, would you, are you one of those people that wants to have an experience though? Or are you just okay with, you know, observing from a distance? Like, how do you approach that? Like, what is your approach on that? I think early on when I, I've been doing this for a very long time as uh, you both uh, have as well. And for me early on, um, so many of my colleagues, You know, when we got into this field, we thought this is going to be easy. We'll solve this case, have a theory for that. No problem. And I think so many of my colleagues at that time burned out because they would often go on these investigations, quote unquote, and nothing would happen. Uh, And year after year, it really just kind of burned them out. So early on, I really shifted from the idea of the importance of, you know, solving the questions or even having a personal experience to more of seeing, you know, what it means in a greater context of us as humans to have these legends and how these legends fit into our beliefs and how they morph and progress over the years and really seeing it as an adventure. But uh, for me, you know, it'd be great. Yeah. What I'd like to see something, I think like a lot of people would be great, but you know, I'm content with never seeing something as well. (laughs) That's I think right. that's would be would be the best approach. Or just having never had to see it would probably be okay with me too. I would have been perfectly fine with that. But then again, if I hadn't experienced it, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And so I don't know. But uh Well, there's always the chance here for me to I can always cross that line at some point, but you know, people that have had that experience, they can't go back to no experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Once nope. you get there, you can't, there's no turning turning back from it. Right. Yeah. You can't unsee what you know, and 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 so many people like I've, I've like like Linda's book. I know what I saw. There's so many people that that they're absolutely convinced. Like this is what I saw, and you know I've cross examined these people. Like I've I've interviewed people three times, and now recently, 
you know, with Ken and Barton have also re-interviewed some of the people that I've interviewed and they're just like, they're unshakable in what they saw. They just like, look, I saw this. One of the things, and, and I'll say this and then we'll, 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 we'll get, go we'll get off here. But one of the things that, that I think is that these things come from another, like, like plane of existence, another density. And it's something that Linda has talked about. And I know Barton, we've talked about this. And I don't know exactly right. what your thoughts are on this, Chad, but like th they can see us. We can't see them. Like if you were to draw a stick figure on a piece of paper and, you know, name him, you know, Larry, you know, we can see everything that Larry's doing. He cannot, he, he is not even aware that we exist. It's like an ant mound next to the interstate. The ants aren't even aware that there is an interstate there, you know, like, you know, much less, they're not even aware of people, much less that there, that there's a highway there that people are traveling on at 70 miles an hour. They have no clue, no concept. And that's kind of how we are, especially when it comes to like the UFO phenomena. I tell people, I was like, we're like ants, dude. I mean, like we have no clue. We're like just living, you know, and, and it's like, we're, we're, we're just unaware to the nth degree. And, you know, if you take the fi stick figure, he can't even comprehend the third dimension. All he knows is the two-dimensional world that he lives in. But we can see everything in Larry's world. We can see everything on that third dimension because we're in another, you know, we're, we're higher up um, in, in another density. And I think that that's what these things are. They can move in and out of their realm. And when, the longer that they're on our plane of existence, I think the more physical they become, but then they can move back out of this density into their density, which is a lot lighter, you know? And that's something that me and Linda had, had talked about, um, you know, on occasion. And I believe we even discussed it on my show. And it's just like, I, I really believe that. I think that that is a very plausible theory because none, none of the other it just doesn't make sense. Like, like there's just so many other weird cases that you can't make sense of. I mean, of course you got the ones where people are driving by and they just see this thing on the side of the road, but there's very little interaction. But then sometimes a trucker or somebody will lock eyes with one of these things, whether it's a Bigfoot or a dog man, and they'll get this overwhelming fear. Their, their blood pressure goes up, their heart starts to race and they'll sometimes report that these things are telling them like, hey, you don't see me. Hey, you know, like what you said about the them being seen. And they're like, how, how can you see me? You know, because they're, 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 they're thinking that they are cloaked. And maybe that's because they think that they're still in a, another level of, of density that they're not, that they're becoming more physical. So that, that's my take on that. What do you think of that, Chad? I agree completely that they seem to be, at least two steps ahead of us, if not more. <laughs> and I, I really approach it the same way. I heard an interview with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist, and they asked him what kept him up at night from uh, sleeping. And he said, the idea that not only do we not know the answers, but we might not even know what questions to ask. We're so far, you know, so far behind that we might not even know the questions, much less the answers. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if this ever is figured out that it's something we've never even thought of. Yeah. And you know, that, that's uh that brings up a, I believe it was Carl Sagan that said that we should be looking for life as we don't even understand it. Um, yeah. Not just life as we know it. They're right. like, Oh, we're in search of life as we know it. Well, you should be looking for life as we don't even understand it because you know, what we do know could barely fill a thimble, you know? And, and it's, it's, it always makes me laugh though. When people are like, Oh, I, I believe in science. I'm like, well, science is very, very incomplete, um, and it's only going to explain so much, you know. And and uh, like, I like Michi Kaku. He's one of my favorite scientists. You know, of course, I have a lot of them. I like Max Planck. There was a lot of different guys that um, science scientists, but I think Michi Kaku is one of the of the like the whole string theory. And you know, when you listen to him explain it, like I listened to him and Joe Rogan talk on, on a podcast one night, and I was sitting there. And while they were bantering back and forth, I was throwing these things out and then they would talk about it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I was listening to it with my nephew. I think he's getting kind of annoyed because I was like, well, that brings up this, you know, and then they would talk about it, you know. And I thought, man, it would be an honor to to talk to this guy, you know, and kind of like just pick his brain about all these different theories and whatever. But uh, it was an honor to talk to you, Chad, and pick your brain, and, and you are a hyper-intelligent uh, person, my friend, and I definitely, we need to do it again. You've written a ton of books. 
Chad, tell us uh, what books have you written? How many have you written so far? Uh, my latest one, which was, gosh, I don't even know, it was my 25th. Wow. So, and most of my stuff deals with, you know, anything, like I said, from ghosts to UFOs to creatures to you name it. So, yeah, yeah they're coming out uh, uh, quick. And so, do, do, do they find them on Amazon or do they, like, where, where would they go to buy your book? What would you suggest? Sure, you can go to my website, Chad Lewis Research, or Amazon, a bookstore, or like, Barton was saying, stop at that roadside tourist attraction. You'll probably you find them there. Copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sign copy. And those sign are my favorites there. of places where people aren't expecting books because, you know, we know the overwhelming majority of people don't go to a bookstore because, one, they can't find one. And two, you know, um, they just go and do that. So when you hit them at, uh, you know, travel stops and this and that, it gets more people into it because, I know Barton, you're probably of a similar age of me where we grew up with authors. Mm -hmm. You know, I grabbed Jerome Clark's book when it came out and I was enthralled where a lot of researchers today, they grew up with TV shows. So when I ask some younger people who their influences are, it's always TV people. Mm -hmm. But in my generation, because Linda Godfrey, the last time I spoke to her, uh, she was, telling me to, to tell all the old gang hello, you know, and all the old gang was you, Sanjay. me, Nick, Nick Redford. Well, not Sanji back in, back in 2005, Nick Ranf- Redford, uh, Ken Gerhardt and Lauren Coleman. That's the old gang to her. Now we're like old people in this field, right? Chad, <laughs> uh-huh. 56 this month. Right. So <laughs> yeah. I threw we're Sanjay in there cause I thought she, th- th- she was always really good friends with him. So. So we spoke really right, highly, yeah. highly of him. But I guess yeah, I guess Sunday the old gang, I guess, going her. back further, you know. Right, yeah. So she, that was the unknown creature spot. She, she started that group up, and it's yeah, still going today, yeah. So Sanjay, he's been around a long time, but I didn't know him back then, you know. I think I, I joined her group 10, or 10 years ago or so. Like when I got on Facebook, I didn't know it existed. But, yeah, we're the, we're the old gang now, so. <laughs> that's yeah. great well, we have a lot to look forward to because a lot of these newcomers are really uh bringing some good game to the to the table and they're looking at things through fresh eyes and non-biased mm-hmm. eyes and they're they're doing some completely non-biased research and allowing the evidence to take them where it leads and not uh, not wanting to you know the evidence to only take them where they want it to go right so they're not cherry picking uh the data so when they're they're uh uh, the witnesses are thoroughly invest, you know, inter- inter- interrogating the witnesses and ask them all the pertinent questions. Like, have you ever had anything strange happen to you before you saw this Bigfoot? Have you ever lived in a haunted house? Have you ever seen UFOs? And you'd be surprised at how many of them say, "Well, yeah." Now that you mention it, every, uh, all my witnesses I ask these questions to, and they look at me like I'm I'm crazy sometimes. But you'd be surprised how many will say, "Well, yeah." Now that you mention it, I did see a UFO when I was 12 years old, or yeah, I did live in a haunted house five years ago. So it's it's really, I think it's really coming full circle that all these things are connected. And we got some really good investigators coming up and doing some really good work. Yeah, and now we're, we're in the age of, like I was talking to you about this, Barton, you know, we're in the age of, of podcasting and people doing, you know, right. it, it's, it's what's kind of become the new thing. Like you have all these influencers on YouTube. Guys like Josh Nanocchio, Tony Merkel, and now Steve Stockton, who's written books too, but he's now doing YouTube and he's doing really well. And <clears throat> th- these are these are the people that are that it's so much easier just to get out there and talk, and you can cover bunches of cases where it takes a lot longer to write. But I hate to see the age of the author end because, you know, as long to me, it'll always be the, the respected profession because you know it's easy to to sit here and talk. But to put pen to paper and then, you know, it just seems like you can, um, like, you know, there's just nothing like curling up with a book. You know, it's, it sounds like a cliche, but just to just sit there and just go into your own little world and read the, the, the book. It just, it's just something about it. I mean, you know, you can talk all day long, but that's, that, that's the purpose for me is writing my book is it's like there's certain things I can just relay and there is still a market for it, you know, but unfortunately it's getting to where more and more people are going toward the social media and toward podcasting. They're just going to Spotify or Podbean or Apple, you know, tunes, you know, whatever, Google. Well, Kindle. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and then, then books, of course, are now being put onto Kindle. But like I tell people, I was like, you can't get a, an autograph. You can't get Chad Lewis or Barton Nunley's autograph on a Kindle. Okay. You can't, and you know, <laughs> so, I mean, I tell people all the time, cause there was this young girl, a uh, young, I say girl, she's young to me. I'm 47. So she's like young to me. She's like 23 or something. And she's like, so where do I download uh, Barton's books on Kindle? And I was like, well, I don't, you, you, you can't. You're going to have to get them signed. And, the, and I was like, and wouldn't you rather have a book signed? Wouldn't you rather have it signed? Because you're not going to get Ken Gerhardt or Barton Unley's book signed. You know what I mean? Like, in, in, unless you order the book, you know, and you, there's no way to do that. And she's like, well, how do I get a signed book? I said, I have one right here. So I sent her a copy of, of uh, I think it was Mysterious Kentucky. Um, and then she was enthralled by it. And she's like, well, I'd like to order some of, of, his, of his books, whatever. And I said, yeah. But that that is the difference right there, you know, and you yeah. like on my yeah. shelf, I have like thousands of books, so many I had to put in the storage before my wife uh, said, you know what, I'm getting out of here because these books are going to collapse <laughs> on me. But I have like so many books, but in, 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 in my collection, I have like, you know, my top 50 that are signed and Chad, you know, some of yours are on there. And so, folks, uh, reach out to me. I'm going to be b- buying a, a large quantity of Chad's books. If you guys want an autographed book from 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 Chad Lewis, if you leave a comment from the show like we do every time we drop an episode on Facebook group, uh, my Facebook group, Paranormal Roundtable, and we can drop the link in, in Barton's and we'll choose somebody. You leave a comment and we'll send you a book. We'll send you one of Chad Lewis's books and, and then uh, we'll have Chad on again for sure. So... From everybody here at Paranormal Roundtable, uh, Barton Nunley, um, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Chad Lewis, uh, good night. Good night, everyone.